and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. In addition, today, as always, we are on Birmingham Area Municipal Access, also on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, as well as 88.1 WBFH, The Biff. In addition, on the web, civiccentertv.com, and on Facebook via Facebook Live, we are joined today with West Bloomfield Parks, facebook.com slash WB Parks. Give them a like and thank them for joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. And of course, with me in the studios every day is Ronnie Dahl as we go through the latest news and information about COVID-19 and more in the local area. Tyler, it's a blah day out there. It is. It is kind of a meh day outside. The good thing, it's warmer. Yes, much warmer. I mean, only here in Michigan will people be ready to, you know, bring out their shorts when it's 37 degrees, but it's warmer. I know, heat, real heat wave out here today, Ronnie. Uh, I, 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 it's kind of a late day for me here with uh, some more meetings tonight, but I might go jump in the lake later. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. Uh, did you cover the uh, Kiko Harbor meeting last night? Uh, no, we did not. That was a special meeting, and so uh, and we were not requested to cover that one. But I, I, didn't, I know it was about uh, their planning study and going into some more details about what they're looking into with that. But no, we had two meetings last night, and it was the West Bloomfield Township Board, their regular meeting, and then the West Bloomfield School District Board of Education. And then what do you have tonight? Tonight's the West Bloomfield Township Planning Commission. <laughs> yes. So oh, they're always thrilling. Uh, Kathy Hagopian, show, the chairperson, yes, uh, of the Planning Commission. So that'll be interesting, 6, six o'clock tonight on Civic Center TV. Uh, so uh, Tyler gets to wear so many different hats here at All Civic Center TV, which hair. includes covering those meetings. I, I did want to, you know, um, catch last night's meeting uh, there in Keiko Harbor. It was a meeting to talk about the Gibbs study into which they're talking about the redevelopment possibilities there in the city of Keiko Harbor but also the surrounding communities as well. And one of the designs calls for making it kind of a walkable community and bringing people in, but which would require building uh, various housing units as well. And, uh, you know, for some people, they don't like change, Tyler. Yeah, it, it, it changes the character kind of of Keigo, Keigo Harbor from more of that smaller town into a little bit more of a medium town kind of feel. But, you know, Look, changes Keigo are going to has happen. no character. Exactly. Come on. <laughs> That's sure. Sure. I mean, it's a it's a mild change, if that, I, I think, from what it seems. It's something that, you know, the city needs to needs to be doing to keep up with everybody else and stay competitive and attract people in. Because at the end of the day, it's about to, ta you know, the tax base and bringing um, amenities into the city. And I remember when we bought our house, oh, so many years ago, I think it's 12, 13 years now since we uh, moved into the key uh, community. And one of the things they were saying back then, there was a master plan that did call for shops and, you know, condos along the, you know, the lake there and making it more of a walkable community. At the time that we moved in, there was even like the Big B Coffee was still there. Um, I used to love to walk over get my coffee and they had a fireplace there in the the coffee shop um, but uh, I think it would be great if they could get it up off the ground and running but again sometimes you just get people that don't like change because traffic is not always a great thing there on Orchard Lake especially yeah. that corner um, in Kego. Yeah, it's, and the traffic in or in Orchard on Orchard Lake and Kego and Sylvan Lake and even through West Bloomfield, it's been something that's been debated between all four, really all four of the communities uh, that we cover here for years of how they can make improvements there to reduce the load of traffic, to make things easier to get in and out of businesses and to residential areas as well. So that's something that's going to continue to be a conversation. I know it's already been. 
uh, at least somewhat of a conversation at least being started between the cities of Kegel Harbor and Sylvan Lake individually and together as uh, and w along with the Road Commission for Oakland County as they look into making some uh, some repairs and changes to Orchard Lake Road in that corridor. Yeah, I, I mean, and it kind of starts at uh, Middle Belt Road right there, and I know that side where the bowling alley used to be is technically West Bloomfield, yes. but there is so much potential starting there and going all the way down that corridor for redevelopment, and I think it would be great if these communities would get together and come up with a master plan as to how to address that. Um, and make it more attractive for people uh, as well, you know. I mean, we love Kegel, but I will say I'm a little disappointed because a lot of the shops have closed down or the little restaurants. I don't know what's going on with Bosco's. If they're going to reopen, uh, I know the little um, burger stand that used to be across the street from Bosco's. What was yeah. the name back in the day? It's been closed for some t some time yeah. now. Yeah, I've seen some historical pictures of it, but I um, don't recall the name. So it had closed down. They were going to make it that Dippin' Dots, which never really opened. And then I was like, why are you putting an ice cream place across from the ice cream place, the Dairy Queen? <laughs> so now it looks like that's being rehabbed. So beginning, beginning of development there in Kegel Harbor. So we hope to see it uh, come to a reality one day. Yeah, hopefully, uh, and something that's only in the preliminary stages. They're looking into what they can do at the council level, at the planning commission level, and in, in the city of Kinko Harbor to determine what direction they should go. And, and of course, they want to have community input on that. That's why they had that special city council meeting uh, last night, joint meeting with the planning commission to talk about some of those issues, to get an update from the Gibbs planning group, which they've consulted with on this issue, and get the community's input as well, see what where the community wants to go, see where the market is going to be going, and balance all of that to do what's best for the city of Kegel Harbor. Yeah, so maybe we'll reach out to um, Rob Kalman, or uh, who's the mayor over there yeah, now? Brian Lample is now the mayor over okay. there. Yes, he was their mayor pro tem, and he's now their mayor. And their former mayor, not not Rob Kalman, but the mayor before him, John Fletcher, is now the mayor pro tem again. It all gets switched around. They switch every year. Welcome to Small City USA. Gotta love it. Uh, so with that, uh, Tyler, did you see the new warning going out to Oakland County residents right now about a potential scam? Yes, yes, I saw that. I, I got the uh, email warning from both Oakland County and from the Sylvan, uh, city of Sylvan Lakes uh, email blasts. Yes. So uh, uh, the Oakland County Health Division issued the warning that someone is trying to scam residents under the guise of attempting to schedule COVID-19 vaccine appointments. Residents have been encouraged to sign up on the county's Save Your Spot wait list, which county public health officials pull from to schedule the vaccine appointments based on eligibility as well as registration. There are currently over 500,000 people registered on the list with the health division administering about 6,000 to 7,000 vaccinations per week. Now, according to the county, there is a potential scam going on that involves a caller asking questions in order to schedule a vaccine appointment and then is asking for personal and financial information Leanne Stafford, the county's health officer and health department director, said county staff will never ask for financial information, including credit card or social security numbers when calling to schedule vaccine appointments. Be warned right now, and sadly, so many people will fall victim to this. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate because it's something that people are looking for more information on. They want to know more about how they can get in line in, in Oakland County for COVID-19 vaccines, how they can maybe advance, they're looking to advance themselves in the line where there's really no way to do that short of being in a priority group right now or being able to prove that. And so these scammers are taking advantage of that and they're getting these people to get to provide additional information, personal information in the hopes that it's gonna advance their spot in line and potentially get them a COVID-19 vaccine sooner. All the more reason why we provide resources at civiccentertv.com that take you directly to those resources that provide that information, that truly provide that information. Oakland County is one of the first links on our page. It brings you to their COVID-19 page, including their vaccine page, which has information about their nurse on call hotline, their COVID-19 help hotline. And you know, even, even if you get one of these calls and you're not sure if it is legitimate, you can always check 
by saying, okay, no, I'll call you back later. Call Oakland County, ask them about it because somebody there will know if they're making those kinds of calls. But as they said, they're not going to ask for that personal information. If anything that you're giving, the information you're giving to them about getting your spot in line is very, very basic. And again, you can find that on their website. And an easy way to get there is just go right to civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus and click on our Oakland County link. I know when I was driving in today, I go past Fire Station 1, and they are doing the vaccine drive-in system through there once again today. Uh, it, they really do have a good system set up. They do. They're talking about possibly using Ford Field as a regional mass vaccination site. I think these drive-through services are so much better. Yeah, I, I think that it's been proven, at least in the case of West Bloomfield's fire department and a couple of the locations, that these are really efficient. They're comfortable for people, for everybody involved, both those frontline workers and the county health workers that are administering this, as well as those getting their vaccines to come through in a, in a quick and orderly manner not have to leave their vehicles, not have to stand in line in lines. And you know, as the weather gets warmer, it'll be a little bit more comfortable to do that and stand outside in the line and wait to go into Ford Field or go down into the field area or wherever it is in a big arena like Ford Field or Little Caesars Arena or whatever else, wherever else they go. But I do think, I do agree with you that these drive-through methods are working really well from what we've seen so far. And I think engaging more of the, those frontline workers in the fire departments and police departments locally, engaging those locations with the county's help and with regional help as well, maybe an even more efficient way to get this done. Uh, this next story, Tyler, I was like, whoa. Uh -oh. The University of Michigan finds first case of COVID spread from the or organ donor to a patient. Surgeons at Michigan Medicine have confirmed what is believed to be the first proven case of COVID-19 spread from an organ donor to an organ recipient through transplantation. A woman in Michigan came down with the symptoms a few days after receiving a double lung transport, tra transplant, rather, tra my apologies, a double lung transplant, and then she died two months later. That's according to the University of Michigan Health System. A surgeon who handled the donated lungs was also infected, but he did recover. The discovery, which was made in October, comes as transplant surgeries are returning to normal levels following a sharp downturn early in the pandemic. It also is leading to calls to change the way lung donations are tested to better detect COVID-19. Now, this has been suspected in several other cases, but this is the first proven case. Yeah, it's a really interesting to, to read this article, learn more about what the University of Michigan has found in, the, in this case. The symptom, symptoms uh, were, sh were shown a few days after receiving that lung transplant. And, and before, even, before this case, we really didn't know very well whether or not COVID-19 could be spread from one person to another through an organ donation. Now, may maybe this isn't exactly definitive. Maybe there are other circumstances in play that may have led to this person getting COVID-19. But this at least is pointing the medical community in a direction that they can look into this further and determine whether or not they need to change the way they're going about organ donation, organ donations during the COVID-19 pandemic to prevent the spread of the virus through donations, which are critical and still need to be done, and people still need those procedures, but it may have to, those procedures may have to be changed a little bit in sequence in order to prevent the spread of COVID. Uh, hey, students, you're not going to be getting a break. Uh, uh, Michigan yeah. students must take the M step despite COVID-19. Uh, Michigan students are going to have to take the M step this spring after federal authorities denied a state request to cancel the standardized test because of pandemic classroom disruptions. The Monday decision from the U.S. Department of Education means students, some of whom still haven't returned to classrooms since the pandemic began 11 months ago, will take the same test as students do at the end of a normal year of learning. It's unclear yet, though, whether students in districts that are still fully remote, as well as students who have opted to learn at home, will be allowed to take those tests in their homes or 
they will be asked to come into the classrooms because you do need a moderator. Uh, the federal government requires some form of a standard, standardized test to compare student achievement between schools and classrooms here in the state of Michigan. That test is the MSTEP. It's administered to students in grades three to eight as well as the 11th grade. And in Michigan, these test scores can really have some pretty severe ramific uh, ramifications, Tyler, because uh, uh, individual teachers, uh, their annual evaluations are usually based partly on student growth measured by these tests. We've, hear, we've heard both sides of this argument uh, throughout uh, the, the past 11 months. One being that we need to get some type of baseline for these students to understand where they are and how much of a learning loss they have experienced throughout the COVID pandemic. Yeah, th and, and this is a, a method that they can use to do that. I think that this is something that, of all the standardized tests that they give kids on a yearly basis, a standardized test like the MSTEP that is about evaluating particularly learning progression and learning loss couldn't be more critical now than it ever has been before. That being said, as was marked in that, as was stated in that article, it is typically used to evaluate schools and teachers as well. And I think this year the focus has to be on learning loss and learning progression in our in our students. Figuring out if they're in, for example, this is given to grades three through eight and grade eleven. If somebody is in grade four, are they reading at a fourth at a fourth grade level? Are they at at the correct reading level? Are they at the correct mathematics level or are they struggling are they are they on average in that grade in that school falling behind or overall in the state falling behind and then using this data not to evaluate the efficacy of certain teachers and certain schools and educating kids but but to guide where schools need to go next year and as this year progresses and as we get back to a hopefully more in-person safe manner of teaching what needs to happen to catch these kids up so they don't fall behind in the long run? Oh, there are so many things still uh, going on that need to be addressed to try to get us back at least uh, it, to where we were. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not even like uh, advancement. It's back to where we are. Uh, so with that, you can always find the latest headlines. Go to civiccentertv.com. Just click on the coronavirus tab, and that's where you'll find the latest headlines, but also direct links to resources to help you navigate the COVID-19 crisis. So with that, we are going to take a quick break, but uh, we have a great lineup for you today on the Megacast. We'll be speaking with a naturalist over at the West Bloomfield Parks. They have so many fun programs going on right now and also another good way to teach our kids get them back out to nature we'll also be uh, speaking with the president of plantera yeah is it plantera yeah it's plantera yeah yeah plantera uh local business here how are they doing in the middle of the pandemic i'll be also interested to speak to him about um where they think the future is because so many people will not be going back to the office so what's the future for them long term as a business. The Ann Arbor Book Society will be with us in the 11 o'clock hour, along with Steve Acho, our favorite singer. Oh, yes. Um, but he wears so many different hats. He does. He's an interesting guy. <laughs> he is a very interesting guy. Uh, and then we will also be rounding out the show speaking uh, with the Michigan Festival Event Association. So a good lineup for you here after this break on the Megacast. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance. Especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID.
The only way to beat COVID the only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. back with us here on the mega cast we want to say thank you to the west bloomfield parks department for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the mega cast on their facebook page so many of us throughout this pandemic we are getting outside and getting in touch with nature and to talk a little bit more let's welcome annabelle rain she is a naturalist over at the west bloomfield parks department thank you for being with us annabelle Thank you guys. I always love that room um, because it's so fun and it's just so engaging as well. Thank you. Yeah, so it was just recently done last year. You know, hopefully again one day we get to have you guys come in and enjoy it. Um, but until then, yeah, you can see it through the screen and our critters that we have living here love it as well. Well, I like the critters there, <laughs> not on my back porch. A friend of mine posted a picture on Facebook. They had a raccoon uh, out on their back porch and you know, everyone has ring cameras right now and it was this great still shot of this raccoon like, hi, let me in, you have any food? <laughs> that sounds adorable. Yes, they are definitely our neighbors. They're always out and about and they're very curious critters. So uh, Annabelle, I have to ask before we kind of jump into your job over there at the West Bloomfield Parks and all the fun things you guys are doing, you actually started your position just before the pandemic. How has it been going? <laughs> Um, it's been an interesting ride. Yeah, so within my first week of starting, um, every quarantine started and we started working from home and doing only outdoor programming. It's been a great experience learning to adapt to something like this. And luckily I have a great staff working with me and a great supervisor. So it's been a really fun adjustment, making everything outdoors. Luckily that's where we're most comfortable. So for us, it was an easy adjustment. And um, we've got great programs too that we've been working on now that hopefully can get people outdoors since indoor options just aren't what people are looking for these days. Yeah, no one wants to be indoors right now. <laughs> uh, so with that, uh, we've talked to, to members of your team uh, quite often throughout the pandemic, but you guys have so many great programs and they are changing quite often as well. So any new ones coming up right now? Absolutely. So right now, our programs, we're in the winter season. So if you want to get more information, you can go and look at our winter guide that's online. Um, but yes, our other naturalists are working really hard on our public programs. A really exciting one we have coming up is the Coyote Song Hike. So that's an adult program that is within the first week of March. And it's the opportunity to go outside and hike with the naturalist to learn about coyotes. They are a predator that usually has a bit of a negative stigma around them. So this is a great opportunity to learn about why they are so important to our environment and habitat. And it's also breeding season for them right now too. So there's always the opportunity on the hike to hear them calling to one another in the night, which is a very exciting opportunity. And you have the naturalist there, so you're nice and safe and coyotes are our friends, not our enemies. <laughs> That is so fascinating because we are seeing and, and hearing so much more about coyotes recently. And I don't know about uh, you, Annabelle, I've been fascinated with the story of the little dog that was stuck on the ice um, down off of that little island in the Detroit River. And they didn't know how to get to the dog. And at one time, there's this photographer who'd been going out and taking pictures because he had a long lens. There was a coyote 
that was stalking this little dog. And so every day you were checking like, <gasps> don't get the doggy, don't get the doggy. And then uh, this past weekend they did a big rescue and the coyote for whatever reason went past the dog. So, uh, but we know that uh, coyotes do attack dogs. We've had it happen quite often here in our um, area. Yep, it can happen. You know, that's why it's important to remember that they are still a predator, um, though that's not going to be their first food source. And really, the best thing you can do is just make sure if your dog is outside, especially a smaller one, to just be present there with them because the coyotes don't want to be around us, just like we prefer to give them their space. So there's always the opportunity, but um, I promise the coyotes are our friends. So, and, and sometimes they look like a dog, too. I mean, they can be a little deceiving. Yes, they definitely can. They definitely have the um, relationship to dogs so that they also camouflage in too. So when you are out, especially in the winter time now, that color of their coat really does blend in and um, it can be easy to spot one and think that it's just a neighborhood dog running around. So if someone encounters one, what should they do? Well, usually when you do encounter one, the first thing the coyote is gonna do is just run away. So they're not as large as a lot of people think. Um, and they don't want to be around us. You know, they're predators and we're not their prey. So if you just shout at it and, you know, make yourself look big, you should not have any problem at all. They should just go the other way and mind their own business. Uh, so when you go on these walks and they're breeding, um, what are you actually listening for? So usually what you're listening for is more of just the howling to each other. Um, and you'll be able to spot them more throughout the day as opposed to just seeing them at night because during breeding season, animals do become more active. Uh, Annabelle Rains with us here on the MegaCast. She's a naturalist over at the West Bloomfield Parks Department, one of our good friends here on the MegaCast. So many people getting outside, enjoying, enjoying the weather and the trails right now. Uh, but can they still go visit your nature center? Because I do know, Annabelle, one of the great things about your program, it's about the touching and the feeling. Can people still do that? Absolutely. So we have a couple of options that we still give those people that experience. One of the options is we have our open hours. So a couple of times a month, we will open up our outdoor natural play area and put out a bunch of activities um, such as an insect bin or bamboo sticks to help build shelters. It allows the kids to come in and touch and interact with the outdoors and nature. And you can find more information about that on our website. But we also have private appointments if that's more what you're looking for. So I like to call it the COVID friendly program. And you can schedule one of those and we have different options. So one of our in-person nature appointments, you can choose whether you would like to hang out by our building and learn an activity or we can take you on hikes around our property. And that's really so you can get out there and experience nature, but you're doing it with a naturalist. So that gives people the opportunity to have us there beside them to touch and feel and interact with the things that they may not realize are out there when they're out in nature every day. So we're really there just to help you appreciate what's out there that you may not realize is there. Okay, let's just be honest. When it comes to some of these critters, I have a hard time getting excited about insects and bugs. <laughs> so how oh, do you okay. entice and get, especially kids at a young age, excited about some of the animals that maybe aren't quite so cute? So what we find is usually with kids, the grosser, the better. They really seem to gravitate towards those things. <laughs> And if they do have that initial fear, we do work with them on it. You know, we don't want to push anything upon anybody that they're uncomfortable with, but it's just learning why they are so important to our environment and how they play an important role. And when people start to understand why we need them, it's a little bit easier to at least respect them. You don't have to necessarily touch them and pick them up. <laughs> and we always try when it's warm enough outside to bring a critter outside uh, because we just want to start that connection with nature. So we actually have our Earth Day coming up in April, and it's a really big, one of our special events, and we always have live animals out from our nature room. We have reptiles and amphibians here, and it starts the connection of people getting to touch and interact with a creature that is harder to find on their own, or that they may have a bit of a fear of, but when you have an expert there, it makes things a little bit more calm. So we always use our um, 
chances whenever we get them to just give someone a small experience to help alleviate any fears they may have. So with that, Annabelle, do you find that kids are more engaging and it's their parents that are the ones saying, ew, no, stay away from that? Yes, so that does happen quite a bit. Um, you know, I myself am not the biggest fan of spiders, but I like to tell parents that the biggest thing to do is to try and not pass that fear along. So, you know, if it helps, just tense up a little bit and tell them that what they're interacting with and seeing is very cool and important. And then hopefully we won't pass those fears along. Annabelle, I know you're pretty new to the job still, and you were in the middle of a, a pandemic and trying to not only learn a new job, but also learn the area. But how have you seen it change a with kids and their engagement during the pandemic? So I know at least relating from the previous job to this one is kids have become much more comfortable outdoors because during the pandemic, everyone was rushing to get outdoors and using our parks, which we absolutely love. That's what they're there for. And now I have kids who are much more willing to come and see me and I have regulars. We love seeing families again and again. So when you get that experience now with kids that we didn't have before, we get to keep building on those relationships with us and nature. So kids are so much more willing and they adapt so quickly. And I think that they've done better than anybody during this pandemic. So they have just been great during these programs. Yeah, we could learn a lot from the kids. Hey, uh, you're a naturalist. How do you get uh, engaged and in love with uh, nature and science? I've always been an outdoorsy person. I went camping all the time with my family um, and it just kind of hit in college what I wanted to do. So I thought I wanted to be, you know, a veterinarian and I knew it wanted to be animal related, but I just had an internship, got involved with education and that was it. I turned my love for the outdoors into passing on the love for the outdoors. So you're helping inspire the next generation. Absolutely, that's the goal. Uh, so uh, not to put you on the spot, but just, uh, you know, we are in the middle of the pandemic and we are seeing um, uh, some of these endangered species in other parts of the, the world come out and enjoy the habitat again because of the lack of human interaction. As a naturalist, what are your thoughts on the pandemic in nature? I think that the pandemic has allowed a lot of people to become more in touch with nature, which is exactly what we want. So it's been a great opportunity for us to just kind of take a step back. You know, I think that it's almost allowed everybody to take a breath, even though it has been such a stressful time and really just connect more and realize what we do have out there and why it, it's so important to protect what we have now. That is so true. We were biking the uh, West Bloomfield Trail and there was this huge turtle. It was massive, like making his way across the trail. And so we wanted to help him get to the other side. I mean, it sounds like a joke, Tyler, right? Yes, you know, uh, <laughs> we're questioning the turtle's motives, at least. That's fine. But he was scary. He was it's scary. My husband w went to pick him up, and he's like, I'm not picking yeah. him up. So we no, kind of like scooted him because we didn't want anyone else on the trail of course. to of course. come across and, and smush him or anything. So, uh, but it is a, a, it really has been amazing during this time to get out and, and see what's in our backyard, but also it's with the season changes. These animals and how they live and interact really change with the seasons. And with that, Annabelle, um, I know that we're coming up into the springtime, hopefully. We want to pass by winter, by the way. Uh, what can people start to expect as nature changes into the next season? Yeah, absolutely. So I know Lauren touched on a few of these animals and how they were prepping for the fall. And one of the ones she had talked about was groundhogs. So groundhogs are a hibernator. They're still hibernating now. I don't think we're that close to winter being over. Yeah, um, uh, pucks the tongue, <laughs> fill, you little critter. <laughs> groundhogs will actually start to wake up from their hibernation in early March, depending on the temperatures and move on from there. Uh, but they're not the only ones who will be prepping for spring that have been spending time underground. Garter snakes actually spend their winters underground as well. They can they stay underground. They can stay underground. Yes, so That's okay. Stay out of my yard. <laughs> of course. I don't like snakes. Oh, no, we like the snakes. We have a garter snake that lives right there. So they will actually gather underground in the tens to hundreds to keep each other warm. And springtime is when they will start to emerge. So we'll have a lot of hibernators and brumators starting to emerge. 
Um, and it's breeding season. Everybody knows spring is baby time. So something you can look for is that birds will actually start singing their song. So birds always have a call, which is how they communicate with each other. So for example, the chickadees, which are those cute little guys you see at your feeders who are black and white, they sing their own name to tell when there's danger around. So they will go chickadee dee dee. And the more D's they have at the end, the more danger. But in the springtime, they will start to sing their song, which is when the males sing to attract the females. So a chickadee male will sing the word cheeseburger. So if you're ever outside and you just hear cheeseburger, that is a male chickadee. So we have those lovely songs to look forward into the spring as well. I'm sitting, I've never heard him say that. Yeah. We've, well, had I promise. Of, we've had a lot of cardinals. Um, at, or around our house this year too. And we were like, wait, which ones are red and which ones are gray? Kind of, right? Yeah, so the males will have the brighter colors because they're the ones that have to put in the effort to attract a female. The females are, will usually have a little bit of red spotting on them, but they are the more dull color um, because it's all up to the male to put on a show. Uh, with that, uh, Annabelle Rains with us here on the Mega Cast. She's a naturalist over at the West Bloomfield Parks. Always great having you. Welcome to the Metro Detroit area. Are you from here? I am not. So before here, I lived in North Dakota. Oh. oh. It's, yes. Notice how Tyler and I both said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we know nothing about We have North no Dakota. desire have to go no, there. We have no idea what's going on in North North Dakota. North Carolina, I'd be like, yeah, cool. Sure. North yes. Dakota, yeah, okay. We well, you, hopefully you'll enjoy this area a bit more than North Dakota, and we wish you the best. But we also want to say thank you uh, for your passion and for joining our team here in the metro Detroit area. Uh, and quickly, Annabelle, before we go, um, anything we didn't touch on maybe that you want to add? Um, I think we covered a lot of it. Just as a reminder, we have our Earth Day event coming up. Um, be sure to check out our website for more winter programs that we have going on throughout the next couple of months. And if you feel interested to come and explore the area and you want a naturalist to join you, just feel free to schedule a nature appointment and I would be happy to give you a personally guided tour of some of our park properties. You know what's so fun about that because you can go out a million times by yourself but when you go out with someone such as yourself you see and you experience it differently so we're so lucky to have you and the team over there at the West Bloomfield Parks Department. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you so much, you guys. You have a great day. Happy day to you, too. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. What day is it? I, I was going to say it's, it's Wednesday, it's but Tuesday. no, it's, it's only close. Tuesday. Okay, take a break, Tyler. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We wanna ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet Wear facial coverings when you leave your home and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. You can always catch Tyler and myself Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon here on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Tune us in to Comcast Channel 15, or if you have AT&T, you can catch us on Channel 99. You can also listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. And then, of course, today we are live streaming today's show on the West Bloomfield Parks uh, Facebook page. And all of those outlets, Tyler, 
What makes this the mega cast? Yeah, we're on a, a bunch of outlets every single day, TV, radio, um, online, and, and all over the place, on demand as well on civiccentertv.com, where you can also find short, short clips as well as just the interviews from the shows and our full episodes. If you're either not able to tune in for the entire 10 a.m. to 12 noon run Monday through Friday, or you only want to see certain parts of each day's shows. A great way to catch our past and previous interviews. So Tyler, each and every day we get the rundown. Do. And uh, I do research in the morning before coming into the studio. And I went down a video rabbit hole today. Uh-oh. Uh, with us next, Shane Pliska. He is the president for Plantera. Great to have you with us. I was sobbing this morning watching wedding videos that were at <laughs> the Plantera. How are you doing today? Good morning. I'm doing very well. Thank you. What an incredible, beautiful backdrop for a wedding. Uh I, I would agree, yes. <laughs> do you ever do that? Do you ever go on and watch some of these wedding videos? Uh, you know, it's interesting you say that because uh, at times, I mean, we all have tough days when I want to feel better about uh, what's going on in the world. I definitely do uh, go onto YouTube and um, or, you know, the different video sites and I see videos I've never seen before. Um, and, you know, we have a good number of years of backlogs to look at it, yeah. I'm a chick. This is one of the things that we do. And if you post it out there publicly, we are going to watch and we are going to look, but it really is um, a beautiful spot to dedicate yourself to someone that you love and to have a wedding. But before we even get into the venue, tell us more about your company. Sure. Um, so Plantera has been in Oakland County um, since our beginning in 1973. Um, we, uh, we grew over the years. Uh, we moved from Troy to West Bloomfield in 1984, and we've been on Drake Road in West Bloomfield ever since. In um, 2009, we built a new facility um, on the same site where the historic greenhouses used to be, um, and that is a botanical conservatory building um, that we actually imported from Belgium. Um, and we did that uh, back in uh, you know, 2009. So it's, it's, it's pretty recent. And um, we are a plant company. We have supplied plants to commercial spaces in our region for uh, well over um, you know, the last 47 years or so. Um, and then when we built our new facility, we started getting demand from people asking us to open up our space to host weddings. And so we added a wedding component to our business and we treat it almost like a separate business to where we have a different staff, we have a different crew of people. Um, and it's just a great combination of talents between um, our, our commercial plant and design capabilities, as well as now on the wedding design side too. Before we jump into more about the wedding design side, when it comes to the commercial building, side of things. How are things going right now in the pandemic? Because while even though office buildings shut down, your plants still need to be cared for. I do, and I suppose that is a, um, a benefit to our business is the fact that most of our clients have decided to main, keep their maintenance service for their plants, even while they have workers working from home. Um, they realize that it's, it wouldn't be good to have those plants die on, on their properties. Yeah, because if you come back after working remotely and then all the plants are dead, you're like, oh, that's just not a good sign, right? But uh, what do you think long term? Are you worried about the long term impact of COVID-19 and the thought that so many of these uh, business models are going to be changing because more and more people will be working remotely? Well, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I actually have a pretty optimistic view um, that uh, our products are typically featured in, in, in the public spaces inside these office spaces. Um, so it's actually the public spaces, the collaborative spaces, the meeting rooms, the lounges, those are the spaces that actually are gonna be in higher demand um, after this pandemic is done when people start doing a work from home hybrid because people still will have to um, collaborate in person in some way or, or another. Um, so we're actually anticipating an increase in sales um, as a result of those changes and those redesigns. Um, 
you know, it's, uh, you know, back in the 80s, they used to put plants on, you know, on the cubicle uh, walls. That stopped probably 20 years ago. Um, so we're definitely not that concerned about offices necessarily shrinking their square footage because we think workspaces are going to expand um, the amount of space they'll use for flexible um, engagements. Yeah, you know, we're already actually, prior to the pandemic, there were so many other uh, companies and countries really uh, that were utilizing that model of flex spaces where you would have some, you know, availability, you could come in, you didn't have to come into that office on that eight to four schedule per se. So uh, that's good news with that. But how do you fight the argument of having real plants versus fake plants? Well, we supply uh, faux plants as well. We say oh, so faux, faux is a, uh, that's a good way to say it. Um, I have faux plants. But uh, it, it is very much a different product in every way. Um, and so a faux plant has a lifespan. Um, and a live, a live plant does too. And, and so um, if, if you've noticed that if, if you bought some faux plants and after a few years they start to get covered in doster, they don't quite look the same. That's part of the lifespan of those. So there is a there is a cost um, analysis that can be done for live versus replica, just from that perspective. But the other perspective is is that live plants have so many benefits. I, it you know we connect with them when something feels when it's real and it feels legitimate. You know that you're dealing with a real situation. So there's all sorts of reasons to have live plants. And the truth is, live plants, quite frankly, are less expensive from a purchase standpoint too. Huh. I will say um, I'm one of those challenged people that can't seem to keep anything uh, uh, alive, but I do not like the look of faux plants. So I always buy them and replace them and buy them and replace them. I mean, the little you get the orchid, right? And it says, put a little ice cube in it once a week. How hard is that? Well, it's pretty hard because mine die <laughs> every single time. You know what? And it's quite all right to, um, to replace your plants. Okay, um, your plants are there for your enjoyment and, and your benefit. Um, it brightens up your space, it makes you feel good, it makes the space look lovely, um, it makes it feel more natural. And we spend so much time indoors, I mean, there's people that have what's called as nature deprivation. And so a big trend in design is what's called biophilia. And that is the incorporation of nature into indoor spaces to make it feel more human. And so if it means that we need to swap out plants more often to make a space feel human, then so be it. Um, it's for our health, it really is. That is a beautiful sentiment as well. So who are your main, main customers for this side of the house? Um, so for the plant service business, it's mostly um, corporate clients. Uh, so this would be the tenants uh, inside um, corporate spaces. It, they could be medical centers, um, it could be universities. Um, any kind of public facing um, indoor built environment, uh, there is typically a, a place for our plants. Shane Pliska with us here on the MegaCast. He's the president of Plantera. Let's jump into the wedding side and the venue side. The whole industry has taken such a hit over the past 11 months. How are you all and your team addressing that side of your business right now? Well, thankfully, we've been able to hold on to our, our key staff members. Uh, that's first and foremost, um, because we've been actively um, planning weddings even as, as they get postponed. Um, so we're planning weddings that are in at the end of this year through 2022, even some in 2023. Um, so we still have plenty to do to plan those with the assumption that the crisis will be over by then. Uh, but yes, it's been a terrible uh, situation for the event industry and hospitality industry overall. Um, and uh, as a company that's engaged in the industry, it's been a responsibility to both uh, to, to, to help out our employees, um, to try to provide information for our clients um, as, as we can. So uh, most of our clients have decided to postpone and just push their dates into the future. Um, and. Um, just take a look at the news as it happens from a day-to-day -day basis, which is not easy for events because with events, um, these are planned months in advance, years in advance sometimes. So it's, uh, it, it, it is a big challenge. And um, I will say, Shane, looking at some of the wedding videos this morning, it seemed like um, 
or at least uh, how the videos were shot, these are smaller, more intimate weddings. Yes, they are. So uh, in that regard, do you anticipate that you're going to be more sought after going into um, the remainder of this pandemic because you do offer that environment and people may feel safer in a way with being kind of like with their cohort? Well, um, it's, it's different for every couple and, and every family for, for, for what um, it is, but it is true that uh, guest counts are trending down because fewer people um, you know, are, are, are traveling as much or, or watching in the near future. And so because our venue is for, um, you know, it, it is for more intimate weddings, uh, it does feel like a more natural fit. Um, and our bookings are reflective of that. Uh, we're, we're just eager to be able to operate at full capacity uh, whenever we're allowed. So with that, Shane, I have to say a conversation just between the three of us here. No one's really watching. Give us some uh, Bridezilla stories because I couldn't oh, wow. imagine having to call up a bride and say, I'm sorry, the governor just switched the requirements as, as of yesterday. <laughs> you can only have 20 people instead of 50 or 100. I'm sure your team has had to have a few of those conversations throughout this pandemic. Uh, we have had plenty of those conversations, but uh, it is a saying in our company that we do not have bridezillas. Uh, <laughs> and, and the reason why I was a bridezilla, I will tell you. Uh, the reason why we don't is a, 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 a bridezilla is really someone who is disappointed, is, is worried about getting disappointed. And yes, there are things out of our control, like the regulations, and they are disappointing. Um, but uh, but we don't cons we don't take any of that disappointment personal when, when that occurs. Um, so I'd say the majority of our brides have been um, very gracious and understanding. Uh, we're all in the same situation together um, and they understand our limitations. And we're really making every effort we can to make the situation better. Um, even if they say, hey, I need to get on with my life. I can't just keep on postponing my wedding. We have found ways to do smaller virtual weddings, um, different ways to do it. Now, obviously we don't get the same kind of revenue in that situation but at least we're able to serve those brides for the moment that they're trying to do and get through in their life. Uh, Shane, I can tell you already that uh, uh, you are a master of words because just the way you rephrase that, we don't have bridezillas. <laughs> yeah. You're good, you're real good, Shane. Thank you. <laughs> but it is about uh, word of mouth as well when it comes to a situation like this and how we handle it and also how you try to accommodate them. And then if they have a pleasant experience, they share it with someone else and someone else and someone else and it continues down. We are hearing now, Shane, that uh, we may have to continue wearing masks through 2022, um, even with the vaccine. How are you trying to plan for the future on both sides of your business right now? Um, well, we've, I mean, we, we adhere to the mask regulations and um, there are ways to plan a graceful event uh, where masks are, are, are being worn. I mean, there's ways to do that. Does it look the same? Not necessarily. Um, uh, their bridal parties have created what's known as bridal pods where they um, have been hanging out in one particular group and maybe the bridal party themselves would choose not to wear masks for some photos. Um, but uh, it's, it's part of our reality. It's something that we're adapting with and we're living with. On the corporate plant side, um, because our people are more or less isolated when they take care of plants, wearing a mask is not an issue whatsoever. Uh, but it, it does get tricky when um, when, when uh, on, the, on the wedding side, when people don't want to have masks seen in, in a photograph, but, um, but there's plenty of ways to stage photographs in ways where it still can be safe. Yeah, it, that is probably the big thing. I've been to a couple weddings throughout this pandemic and they incorporated the mask into the event and they had them made uh -huh. with their names and their dates and this, that and the other. But uh, it's like you said, it's, it's that photograph um, because yeah, we can Photoshop it out, but still not quite the same. Yeah, um, but I, again, all of our customers have been really understanding and they wanna get creative, um, they, they wanna make it work, they wanna have a fun time. Um, so all, all these attitudes are in the right space, place. It really is, it's true. I, 
and I really think it's going to be fun for them 20 years from now to have to try to explain wearing a mask in their wedding photos, right? Because that's that's such a generational thing where we go back, we look at our grandparents and their wedding photos, and then to have one with a mask on, that's going to be quite the story that you can share with the future generations of your family. Hey, as Shane, before we let you go, I do want to ask, uh, you have a degree in film, and while I understand that's a family business. So how'd you make the transition? Uh, well, all, all business is show business in its own way. Um, so uh, the event part of our business truly is, uh, has a very strong parallel of producing a movie. Our brides are our stars. Um, the show always must go on. Um, that, that's how we operate it. Um, and you can never do a redo though with a wedding. So um, it's part of our culture. That's why we have such a great track record for producing magical events um, that most of the time are relatively flawless. It really, it's like uh, producing a live event for uh, film, right? Absolutely it is. <laughs> Shane, you're a master with words, I will say that. Uh, quickly before we let you go, uh, anything maybe we didn't touch on that you wanna share with the public before we say goodbye? Um, I, I just wanted to share that, um, you know, our botanical conservatory, which you see behind me, um, people are welcome to come through. Um, these days it's by appointment, but um, if you'd like to visit, just give us a call. We're happy to give you a tour. You mean, like the general public? Yes, if, if someone would like to have a tour and, and take a look at the plants, you can call us. Um, and we're happy to show you around in our space, especially on these winter days. Um, I'm so fortunate to be in such a beautiful space um, with so much greenery um, when it's uh, snowing out. So um, we know we like to share that with the community when we can. Oh my gosh, that is so awesome. I'm taking you up on that, like around, you know, mid to late March, when you start to see video from other parts of the country and it's green and the cherry blossoms are coming out and we're still looking at dead grass and snow piles. And uh, it really must be uplifting to your to your mood to be able to be around such uh, beauty. Absolutely. Well, Shane, it's been great talking to you. We appreciate your time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hey, uh, quickly before we let you go, if people want to schedule an appointment to do that, take a tour, how can they do that? Um, they can visit our website, plantera.com, um, and uh, fill out the contact form and just say, uh, I'd like to tour. Great, thank you so much. And I will say, uh, also while you're on there, Google them with weddings and uh, you'll see some beautiful events that have been held at their location. It's gorgeous to see uh, such an amazing backdrop, but also to watch people dedicate their lives to one another. Shane, thank you again for being with us. My pleasure, have a good day. We're gonna take a quick break here on the Megacast. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's going to be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. back to the Oakland County Megacast. Just as a reminder, you're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake W or 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. My cheat sheet was uh, hiding behind the mic here, but I did manage to bring it in. Oh, look, Tyler, my mirror holds it up. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, good <laughs> balance there. I know they laugh at me because when you come into the studio, when it's Tyler and Dave, they have like water or coffee. I come in, I have like mirrors and wipes and sanitizer and pins and mirrors. It's just crazy. 
Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot you bring in. You come ready to go in every situation. We're just in here like, all right, I got my paper. I got a couple of things. And I'm just going to be clicking buttons like mad. Uh, but yeah. one of the things in the new studio, Tyler, it's the lights. And you yeah. can really see your flyaways a lot. You can. And you can. so I try to make sure that I um, have them like super sprayed down because I always have a lot of flyaways. So. These are the things. Yeah, hey, uh, welcome back to the second hour of the Mega Cast. Uh, it's a reminder for anyone that may be, be tuning in here for the very first time, 11 months into the pandemic, and uh, about, about 10 months into the show. This show actually was developed because of the pandemic as a way to try to address all the situations that are going on here and impacting all of us within the community when it comes to COVID-19 and this crisis. Uh, back when Tyler and Dave started the show, but you thought a couple weeks? Yeah, remember, a that, weeks remember that uh, two-week pause to uh, uh, yes. flatten the curve? Oh, of course. <laughs> who, who could ever forget that, that period of our lives? Well, Dave Scott has uh, moved on to bigger and greater things, uh, managing Motown Digital as business gets back on track for him. And so Tyler and I continue to do the show as Tyler also tries to manage running a Civic Center TV on top of his duties here. But the goal of the show is really to be able to uh, bring you long form interviews with so many different people that are impacted with the COVID-19 uh, crisis, but also how they're managing as well. And so with that, we're going to kick off the second hour of the show today. Rachel Pastiva joins us. She's the president for the Ann Arbor Book Society, a nonprofit organization in the Ann Arbor area. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm like you. I'm a book person. Don't That's you just great. love like books and turning the pages and the smell of books? Nothing uh, compares to it. But how's it been during the pandemic? Are people reading more? And if so, are they actual reading books? Uh, you know, um, I think that people are definitely reading uh probably just as much, if not more, uh, books than they were reading before then. Um, our independent bookstores in Ann Arbor uh, are still, um, you know, most of them, they're all open. A couple of them are not open to the public for in-person browsing, but they're all open. And um, they're all still, they're still being sustained by um, the book orders that they're getting, the people coming in. Um, so, so people are just def definitely desperate to have reading materials during this time. Yeah, I kind of feel like we're in um, a, a different phase of the pandemic because in the beginning, everything was shut down and it was really a struggle. Now, uh, retail outlets such as bookstores are allowed to be back open to the public, but with limited capacities. So how is that impacting some of these smaller independent bookstores? You know, um, I think like every small business and really like every person, um, you know, the bookstores have to um, think about the risk to themselves. You know, they all are different sizes. They, um, some of the bookstores are very small, so it's hard to get through them. Some of them, you know, have a larger staff or um, multiple floors. So, you know, the, the, the limitations kind of affect them differently. So, so they've all had to make really personal decisions on how they want to operate during this time. And uh, like I said, a couple of the bookstores, a literati bookstore and bookbound bookstore have remained closed to in-person foot traffic, but they are still doing curbside pickup. And um, the other bookstores, the, all, all the other bookstores do have, um, you know, hours that people can come in and, and browse, um, but they're also trying to be creative and um, find ways for people to connect. You know, I know Nicholas Books over on the West Side, you know, they have like Facebook Live author events. Literati is doing a series of, you know, at home at Literati so that they can still find ways to be connecting with people, uh, even though, you know, they can't have these big events in their store, people can still uh, connect with the bookstores. Rachel Pastiva here with us on the Mega Cash. She's the president for the Ann Arbor Book Society. What made you want to start your nonprofit? So that's kind of twofold. Um, I am, I'm not from Ann Arbor. I'm not even from Michigan. I'm actually originally from Northeast Ohio. And I am like you, I'm a book lover. I have been my whole life. I'm also and a Buckeye, actually, by the way. So I'm, sorry? <laughs> I'm a Buckeye oh. as well. So oh, awesome. <laughs> 
Um, so, so, you know, I actually came to Ann Arbor because of the books, in part because I was working at a Borders in Ohio, and I transferred to a Borders in Michigan, but uh, at, at Arborland in Ar Ann Arbor. But I actually, you know, at that time when I worked at Borders, you could really transfer to any place in the country and really internationally. But I wanted to move to Ann Arbor because the first time I stepped foot onto Liberty Street in downtown Ann Arbor uh, about 20 years ago and saw that there were about probably five independent bookstores within walking distance just on one block, I said, this is where I want to be. So. So I moved to Ann Arbor. I was working at Borders for a few years. And after leaving Borders, I, um, uh, I started to managing an independent bookstore um, on Main Street called Crazy Wisdom Bookstore. And I managed that for 11 years. Um, and I left there about four years ago. But during that time, I got to uh, really see what it um, takes, you know, the challenges of running um, an independent bookstore. And at the same time, I uh, got to know a lot of the owners and managers of the other local independent bookstores downtown um, and, and around town. And I got to really see what a labor of love it is to own a bookstore and operate a bookstore. And, um, you know, I'll let you in on a little secret. No one opens a bookstore to make it rich, you know? Uh, they open a bookstore because they think that, that books have value and they want to give access to books uh, to their community. So I really got to know a lot of those bookstores. And, um, you know, uh, so part of me having this organization was to, uh, you know, my love of the bookstores, but, you know, uh, Borders left and it closed in 2011. And um, in 2013, there was a rumor on the street that there was going to be a new independent bookstore coming into downtown Ann Arbor, which was gonna be Literati Bookstore. Uh, and, you know, this is, as a preface, you know, this isn't a slight against Literati. Literati's actually done phenomenal work since they've opened. They've contributed greatly to the um, book culture in Ann Arbor, um, most notably by putting us on the map in 2019 when they were uh, named nationally as the bookstore of the year. Uh, so, so they've actually done a great deal since the time they've opened um, to contribute to Ann Arbor's book culture. And incidentally, another bookstore opened around the same time in 2013, Bookbound, and on the north side, and they've also also contributed greatly to the book culture but but the word on the street and in the media um, at this time was uh, thank goodness you know Ann Arbor is gonna get a bookstore again and um, I came from you know Northeast Ohio my bookstore was a Walden books at the mall 45 minutes away you know and I was so surprised to to hear you know the media and people on the street saying oh my goodness we're getting a bookstore and you know having myself be managing an input independent bookstore downtown and knowing a lot of the owners of these bookstores you know we had um aunt agatha's which was a award-winning mystery bookshop and uh vault of midnight an award-winning comic book shop that has since expanded to detroit and grand rapid uh, grand rapids and um you know nicola's which is still the largest independent general bookstore on the west side of ann arbor was operating and there are several um well-loved specialty and used bookstores that had been around at that time for already all 30 years. And so, so it was really surprising to me that people were thinking, oh, we're getting a bookstore in Ann Arbor again. And I thought, wow, there's a real disconnect here um, between what I know to be a book town and what people think um, of Ann Arbor. So I just really felt like there was an opportunity for me to, to help people to see what I see um, in Ann Arbor and um, get them to be excited and celebrate it. Uh, but even prior to the pandemic, the bookstore industry was on a lifeline because people had stopped going into the bookstore because they're getting everything online. So now you throw a pandemic into the mix. What is the future of the bookstore industry, do you think? You know, it's, it's interesting because I was thinking about that and how, you know, really this pandemic, you know, of course, it's been really hard for everyone, every small business. And, you know, bookstores, of course, are included in that. But, but really, bookstores have been struggling for a long time because of uh, Amazon, you know. Um, uh, Ann Arbor, it's, it's been disheartening to me because Ann Arbor is often voted as the one of the best red cities in the country. And, and that's from Amazon, who's voting that, who's, you know, collecting that survey and so it's frustrating to me to be in a book town and people in Ann Arbor are still buying their books from Amazon but so so bookstores though you know they've always had to be creative you know they've always had to find ways to um, make sure that they are um, you know viable to their community and for me that fortunately we live in a book town and I think people who love books they understand that 
a bookstore is more than just you know a place that you pick up a book. It's it really contributes to the um, consciousness of the city. It really helps to shape a city. And um, they they're gathering places. Um, they have events and they host local authors and they you know are a place for discussion. And so so that's something you're never going to get from Amazon. Um, and you know I'm grateful that our bookstores now are still. Um, you know, it's a testament to them um, that even in this time of um, this pandemic, they are still, they're still, I mean, I don't want to say thriving. I mean, I think they're all really still struggling, but they are, um, they're all still here. And I think that's, that's because people value what they are to the community. They are the fabric of a community. Uh, but like you said, it's a gathering place. A lot of these independent bookstores are smaller, but one of the big draws as well, their ability to get some of these authors to come in and do book signings and book discussions. But right now in the middle of the pandemic, is that even happening? Yeah, I mean, and that's where, you know, Literati has been really creative with that and they continue to have um, incredible, I mean, there was an event with Bill Gates, um, Simon Winchester, they, you know, they're still getting all of these big names because they're doing the series um, at home with Literati. Uh, and like I said, um, Nicholas Books are doing some Facebook Live events with authors. So, so they're really trying to find creative ways. And, you know, one of the things that I think that's come out of the pandemic that's kind of nice is that, you know, everything is happening virtually now. So you don't even really have to be in Ann Arbor, you know, um, you can be just going online um, and getting to check out things from a bookstore that you might not have, you know, been close enough to, to visit and check out otherwise. Yeah, that is a good point. Uh, what about authors? Are you seeing new authors pop up during this time? I can't really speak to that. No, I haven't. Um, I don't really have an experience in that. Because I would think it'd be so hard right now to write a book. Uh, my sister-in-law wrote a book about her father's death, uh, but uh, just prior to the pandemic, it had all of these events and book signings scheduled, and then the pandemic hit. Uh, so I know that she has been trying to do some like virtual Zoom, uh, you know. But it, it again, it's just not the same. Because one of the beautiful things about a bookstore is the browsing. And I know Amazon likes to say, recommended for you. Nope, not the same. <laughs> like, you know, you go through and especially like, you know, the discount books or this, that, and the other, and you find new authors that way. Yes, yeah, and you know, and booksellers too. I mean, that's their business. So they're voracious readers and you can go to the bookstore and they'll, you know, they'll pull a book off the shelf for you. And you know, that might be the book that's gonna change your life. So I know one of the things with your nonprofit is not just about um, promoting the independent book uh, and, you know, companies there, bookstores there in the Ann Arbor, but also the love for reading. How has that changed during the pandemic? Um, well, like I said, I mean, I think people are more so now than ever really reading. Um, and they're just kind of anxious. People are anxious to get their, their hands on books however they can. I think that people are still trying to connect. You know, I myself have been part of a book club and I, I know that people are still, you know, connecting with each other virtually. And so I think people are still trying to find ways to be excited and uh, connect with books. And I, I know people just in my, you know, uh, circle that, you know, people, somebody buys a book and then they, they share it with another person and they just kind of loan it out to, you know, a bunch of different people uh, so that so that everyone can have access to it. And I love that because that's one thing that cannot take place uh, when you download a book uh, because it is easy, right? Like sometimes I will say when my brother-in-law and I, we share books a lot, but we read the same authors. Well, now when you download them, it's not so easy to be like, hey, here, let me, you know, pass a book to you right. and uh, share it that way. Uh, one of the things I also like to do is go to, um, you know, it's typically in the summertime at the fall or summer festivals where they have the big book sales and it's like hey here's five dollars um fill up the bin with as many books as you can get right so i'll go through and then i'll read as many but also i donate all of them to uh, a homeless shelters people don't mm -hmm. think that you know the homeless shelters need books but when you're out on the streets it's a great way for them to escape reality which we've all been trying to do right now right 
Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, books. I mean, that's one of the great things about books is that they they can um, they can be a good escape. And I think, you know, when you talk about reading habits, I mean, one thing I will say is that I do think people, sometimes people are having a harder time reading right now, you know, um, because they can't concentrate. There is a lot of anxiety. Um, but I think people, too, are maybe reading maybe more books uh, as an escape as opposed to maybe more serious books. You know, maybe they're reading more um, lighthearted fiction and, you know, some thrillers, things that they can really be engaged with instead of some more serious, uh, you know, topical nonfiction books. Right, because we're tired of the news. Um, yes. We've already been through our Netflix. We binged every Netflix show. We've yes. uh, been through Hulu. You know, right. I'm sorry, but yeah. we're, we're tired of watching TV. And yes. a book is a great way to uh, escape your reality for a few hours. Yes, yeah, and maybe even read that book that those Hulu shows and Netflix shows were based on, you know? Oh, see, I can't do that because, uh, well, I like to read the book and I can't watch the movie afterwards because I'm screaming at the movie yes. the entire time saying, number one, your character doesn't look like the character I built in my mind. And number two, you changed the ending. Yes. <laughs> So yes, that's why I try to wait. I try to wait a few years between them so that I have forgotten, you know, um, the details and I, you know, I won't be so upset whenever it doesn't end up the way I expect it to. Rachel Pestivo here with us on the Mega Cash. She's the president for the Ann Arbor Book Society. Rachel, do you do that, though, where in your mind you have built uh, this image of the person of the character of a book. So when they do a movie, you're like, oh no, you can't do that. Yes. <laughs> that person looks nothing like the person I thought to be character. playing that role. That's not the character. Yes, yes. And I, I, I think it's so fascinating to think that, you know, just through putting words together on a page in a certain way, you know, you can create, because, you know, usually in a book, they're not giving you every single detail about who this character is or what they look like or how they sound, but, but you've been able to just create that that image so clearly in your mind right it, it, that's the beauty of our creativity and what i yes. see is what is different from what you see or what's different from tyler uh, rachel what's the future uh, for your nonprofit? well you know right now um we're going to actually be celebrating our five-year anniversary coming up this summer and um in honor of that we're really hoping to start an oral history project um since the beginning we've really wanted to make history a big part of what we do because you know ann arbor is a book town uh, people aren't aware that it's a book town and we're really trying to get the word out and so history is a really important piece of that and a lot of ann arborites you know they came to ann arbor uh, to go to school uh, and fell in love with Ann Arbor and they never left. So when they were in school, they they were working at the local, you know, independent bookstores, they were working in the library system. So, so they have a lot of fond memories of these now closed iconic places in Ann Arbor. And we'd really love to start capturing um, their their memories. Um, and so, so that's kind of a short term thing we'd like to do with the history of Ann Arbor, uh, history of books in Ann Arbor, but we'd also like to uh, start a timeline of the history of books in Ann Arbor. And I would, absolutely love to see if every building in Ann Arbor that's ever housed a bookstore had a plaque on it, uh, because I think that would be a really tangible way for people to realize just how many bookstores have been in Ann Arbor. Uh, Borders itself, uh, there would be plaques on five different buildings because in its first few years, when it first opened in, from 1971, in the first few years, it, it expanded so quickly that it, it moved five times. So so we really would like to, to do more um, history of the bookstores, but in the short term, we're really um, wanting to to expand our website. Uh, right now, um, primarily we're reaching people through a monthly email newsletter, but uh, we really want, we're hoping to get some more uh, volunteers uh, to help create more content so that we can have more regular news uh, and, and to be our, we want our website to become to the go-to place for people for any book news um, in Ann Arbor. That is so awesome. How can people uh, volunteer or also find out more about the organization? Yes, um, they can go to our website, a2books.org. We do have a monthly email newsletter. They can sign up right there. There's a pop-up that shows up and um, they can contact us through our website too if they're interested in learning about uh, volunteer opportunities. Rachel, it's been so fun having you on the show. We appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Ronnie and Tyler. It's been uh, great having you. Well, we look forward to meeting you in person one day. I would love that. <laughs> Rachel Pestiva with us here on the Mega Cast. She's the president for the Ann Arbor Book Society. We're going to take a quick break here on the Mega Cast. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. 
The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. to have you back with us here on the mega cast we want to say thank you to the west bloomfield parks department for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the mega cast on their facebook page you can always catch us on civic center tv birmingham area municipal access but also if you have cable thank you a portion of your fee helps support programming such as this tune us into channel 15 on comcast and 99 on at&t tyler our next guest intimidates me uh-oh I'm not oh, wow. afraid to admit it because when you pull up Steve Ochoa's website, he's a keynote speaker, technology staffing executive, an author, bilingual consultant, musician, athlete. Come on, he is superhero. And with us now is Steve. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, and thanks for saying that. That's I'm not sure I've had anyone say that that was a. Uh, intimidating <laughs> you have had so many successes in life what do you contribute that to uh most of it uh luck i would say not that i don't work hard but um you know i won the the lottery as far as who i the family that i was born into my mom and dad are amazing and have always been great role models and supportive of anything i did or wanted to do um but yeah, I think, you know, part of it is that I'm just so curious out of anything else. I'm like intellectually curious is how I would describe myself. And so I'm always looking to learn and I'm always uh, kind of testing things. So everything to me, you know, there, a lot of people, they've almost fetishized failure, right? There's a book called Fail Faster and the whole West Coast um, Silicon Valley community is like, you know, fail as fast as you can and iterate and try and figure out what works. And it's like, I understand what they're saying by that. And I think it's great. It's a great message. But the way I look at it is there's really no such thing as failing because everything is just a test. I mean, if you look at everything like a test, it doesn't matter what it, a job could be a test to see if you like this job and if you like this career and if you like the people you're working with. And so if you view it that way, there's no such thing as failure. And so to not even have that as part of your vocabulary just has you trying everything if you're interested, you know? That's one of the things I do say uh, when I speak to up and coming journalists, one of the things I always mm -hmm. tell them, take any job in every job right. because you need to learn. And when you stop learning, you stop living. So even if mm -hmm. it's the worst job in the world, 
you've learned you don't like that job <laughs> and you yeah, want to do exactly. something yeah, else. It was a good investment. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that too because there's there's kind of like conflicting, seemingly conflicting advice. Like I've one of the, the uh, one of my mentors is Derek Sivers, who's a pretty well known musician, but he started a company called CD Baby years ago. He was the first independent seller of music. And he sold his company for $28 million and immediately gave $27, $27 million to music for schools in the United States. Just a fascinating, amazing guy. And he has this concept that he calls hell yes or no. And what that means is basically, if you don't feel like hell yes about this job or this vacation or anything, then just make it a no. Because why do you want to live your life being at fives and sixes when you could be at eight, nines, and tens? And so part of that, he says, like he really manages his schedule and leverages it to where he wants to put his time. And especially someone like him who has people coming at him all the time, he has to be really, you know, he has to really consider what's a good investment of his time. So in one one year I have this advice that I do follow, which is, you know, hell yes or no. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna say yes to this project or this business partner or whatever because I really feel strongly about it, or else no, I'm gonna be very picky. But that's you know, I'm close to fifty years old. So I can do that. And, and we can do that when we're more established, but the advice that you're giving up and coming people should be the opposite. And you're right about that. You don't even know how to focus on what you want to do until you've been through several iterations and you've done different hobbies and been exposed to different industries. So you're absolutely right. Like take on everything that you can so that you grow to a point where you're really picky about what you take on. And so for me, at this point in my career and in my life, I have this little mental checklist, this mental criteria whenever I take on any project, whether it's business related or not, is it something that is bringing something new and useful into the world? Am I working with other people that are smart and that I can learn from? Um, will it have impact? And then the very last one is, will I at least break even in terms of spending my time or money? Um, and obviously you can't say that about everything. I'm not gonna pretend making money isn't important because it is. But when you have that, that checklist in your head, then you can say, hell yes, this checks all the boxes or no, it doesn't, you know? That's such a great philosophy. I know that we have you on the show today to talk about your new song, but before we get there, <laughs> can I ask you, uh, when you mentioned having a mentor, how mm -hmm. important is it for people to find a mentor in the industry in which they're hoping to succeed to help guide them along the way? And how do you find a mentor? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, or were you I, I just lucky to, to, to come across these people? Yeah, well, uh, obviously a good part of it is luck. I consider some mentors people that I haven't even met in person. Um, I may have, you know, I've had a few email exchanges with and, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the system is to find a mentor, but at the very least, I would encourage people who are early in their career, even if it's not some kind of a long-term relationship, if you think you want to go to medical school or law school or whatever it is that you're going to spend a significant amount of your time on, go to someone or preferably more than one person, not necessarily as a mentor, but just to ask smart questions like, you know, what... I, everything from the practical, like what is what is the landscape like now and what do you think it'll be like in four or five years? What are the best and worst parts of, of being in this industry? And when you get to the end first, because um, you're gonna go through whatever it is that you're trying to learn, it doesn't matter. You're gonna spend a lot of your time learning it. Make sure that at the end, you're able to do something that you really are passionate about doing. So even before mentoring, it's like just just get the advice of smart people and learn from what they've done. But absolutely, like I, I think it's so important now, I've always thought that, but now there are apps developed that are for finding a mentor and you can pay X amount a month and have a life coach or a business coach or, and I just think, you know, first of all, if you have friends or family members, which I happen to that I can go to for advice, um, just, 
running things by another person who isn't you <laughs> and who's a smart person, automatically they have a perspective that you can't possibly because you're always living the movie of your life and they're outside of it. But to have someone who has stories and who has anecdotes and who has you know, experience with, with things, you go to them and these are your mentors. And then that, you know, you, you're held accountable to everything that you're saying that you wanna do. So yeah, I, I just think it's so important. You know, and one of mine is my dad. So I'm, I'm lucky, like we live near each other and I can talk to him all the time. And you know, a lot of people go to him for advice. So like I said, I won the lottery with that one. <laughs> That is so awesome, um, and you're such a lucky person. But, you know, I will say, I, a lot of times for some of the, like, college students, my niece is about to graduate, um, and it's like, hey, it's okay to reach out to people. Find them on LinkedIn and send them an email and say, hey, I'm a student, I'm about to graduate, I would love to pick your brain, because I do think so many people want to give back or give forward to the sure. next industry or the next generation of people who are going to lead us through this world. Uh, but and just saying. I would love to get your advice and just saying that line right there I'd love to get your advice on something most people are just most people are nice <laughs> they're not they're not the negative news stories we hear most people are happy to, to help if they can you know very much so and with that um, it, we know that you're here because you have a new song that came out um, what's it been like to be a performer though during the middle mm. of a pandemic when everything shut down <laughs> well I am, again, lucky there because even though I performed all the time, I would do at least one a month somewhere. I'm not one of those musicians who's making a living that way. So when bars close down and stuff, I haven't played live in bars multiple times a week for several years. Um, so that, you know, I, I love performing and I love being around other people and having the energy of the audience. So I think it's changed more. I feel worse for my musician friends who are just doing it all the time um, but a lot of them have just adapted and, you know, quickly gone to this, um, this remote, you know, performance route. Um, I did one pretty big concert that had like a four camera video shoot and a, uh, audio tech guy. And it was really professional and well done and fun. And I'll probably do another one of those too, but yeah, it's, it's really just changed everyone's lives i mean imagine all the tours that were supposed to happen right last year and this year so very different world uh, but you're also a keynote speaker for so many events and those you know i think back to these companies and corporations and they would bring everyone together and you know um, have days of conferences and bring in speakers such as yourself and performers um mm -hmm. is that going away it's really hard to know what's going to happen in that industry, you know. I mean, a good portion of people have have really adapted and pivoted now that we can't all have a bunch of humans in one room. Um, I just got an invite to do a keynote in Florida in a couple of weeks. And for me personally, no matter how safe they're being, um, I'm not yet comfortable getting on a plane and going to Florida and being around other people. So I had to turn it down, but there are events going on. And, you know, there are um, companies and organizations that are booking keynote speakers just, just like this. They're still live in front of you. There's nothing like the energy of, of being around other people. You know, I, I can't pretend that it's the same, but, um, but I, I think that the industry, people still need that. You know what I mean? They need to have the energy of another person that they look up to, like a keynote speaker, and and get that info, not just in the impersonal way of reading their blog or their book. You are a very energetic person and someone that's a very creative person as well. How have you filled that void of that energy coming off mm -hmm. of another person during the pandemic? Yeah, that's a good question. I. I almost didn't even notice it until I did the first performance where I had, you know, dozens and dozens of people watching me live and I knew they were there and I've got cameras all around me and I'm just performing. And, you know, it, it was probably an hour and a half show. So I play a song and it's not like, it's not like I need everyone to applaud me. There's just no energy. It was the weirdest thing to, to just play a song and be done and you know, there's four people in the room with me who, by definition, aren't listening to me because they're doing their jobs. 
And so it's like, I know I'm performing to people, but there's no back and forth energy. There's no, I, I, you know, when I'm playing live, I can tell if someone's more interested in their phone or if they're loving the song or if they think it's funny. So yeah, that it's, it's an adjustment to not be able to have the energy of being in front of people. So it's, it's been difficult. In terms of being creative though, um, I've always, for the most part, other than writing songs with friends and other songwriters, I'm pretty much in my own bubble when I'm being creative anyways. So, you know, my phone's off and um, I'm on the piano and I say, all right, I'm gonna take the next half hour and write a song about this. So that's that doesn't really depend on being around others. Actually, it depends on me being alone. So, <laughs> <laughs> so on that, well, the pandemic's worked out good yeah. for you. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Steve Acho here with us on the Mega Cast. One of the things that I enjoy about you, you don't go the typical route. One thing we hear over and over and over doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's like this is the process. This is how you get here, and this is what you have to do. But mm reading your website you have found success by making your own path yeah i appreciate that well one of the things i think you do is you make your own path but then you go back to at least for me because one of the ways that i you know in our minds we all have a way that we grade ourselves like our report cards and for some it might be how many friends they have or uh how much money they make or whatever it is, doesn't matter, but we grade ourselves that way. And I noticed for me that I kind of grade myself on how helpful, how useful I can be to others. And so whenever I learn how to do something and I think I can hack that and help people, like for example, you know, I created this methodology for learning a second language really fast, like being very functional in a second language. and it's not that this is the way to do it and there's no other way, but this is a very reliable path, even for people who think they're bad at languages, and here it is. And so sometimes you break all the rules and figure out what works, and then you write that down and say, this is the most reliable way that I think I can get you from A to B. It took me 10 years, it should take you one if I'm doing a good job, you know? So you do you do want to try and deconstruct anything that's even moderately successful so that it's useful to others. So, and that is, that's why I write my blog. Um, it's the only reason really that, that I write a blog. It's not, I don't check to see how many people are reading it. I don't, you know, I'm not advertising. There's no uh, money-making scheme there. It's just to share really short chunks of info that were really important and practical perspectives for me that, that helped me through life. So just to share that with others. So with that, how can people hear your new song? Well, if you just Google my name, um, it's good and bad. I can't rob a bank or do anything because there's only <laughs> one Steve Acho. But um, yeah, just steveacho.com has, has all of my info and links to everywhere. But pretty much any music platform that you use, whether it's Spotify or Apple Music or iTunes or there's so many of them, um, Pandora. Um, if you just pop my name in there, you will see all the music. I think I have, I just had to count these. Uh, I have about 170 songs, you know, between singles and albums um, that are available. So that's that's a lot of Steve Acho. I don't know if you want to listen to all of them at the same time. It's a little too much. Hey, maybe one a day, right? Maybe one a day, yeah, good. Hey, is, no, keep them streaming, you know? Uh, there you go. Hey, There's is, a few thousand streams and I can buy a cup of coffee, so it, uh, it's great. That's good to know. But, uh, you know, um, what are your goals for this year? Do you set goals? Uh, I do, but they're they're not necessarily specific financial goals or anything, but it's just, it's, it's actually, it comes in the form for me. So I like the 80-20 rule. So what I do is I look at my, my investment of time and energy, and I say, what are the few things that pay off the most? And what are the few things that I need to stop doing? So my goals are more of a to-do list and a not-to-do list. Um, and so it's basically, you know, in all the categories that I have in my mind under professional and personal, um, it's understanding more and more what's working and do more of that and understand where I'm spinning my wheels and doing less of that. So it's a little more ambiguous than just like a million dollars by this date, you know. I know, but it works, though. It's good advice for all of us. Steve Bacho with us here. Before we say goodbye to you today, anything you want to share? 
Um, let me think of what I, I guess for, for people that are, uh, in case this is useful to people that are having a hard time not being around others, um, I see that depression is was high before, but it's it's skyrocketing up now. Um, and I think the two things that have helped me and and will help other people is to uh, be really disciplined. I mean, I'm I've been working out of my house for about ten years, so this isn't new to me to have a home office and you know not get up and do laundry in the middle of the day unless I'm that's part of my plan. So I've been pretty disciplined about doing it, but. Um, when you're used to waking up in a place that isn't where you work, you have to be disciplined and have rituals. So I think what helps people, you know, young and old alike, is just being disciplined and having a morning routine and having a night routine and having a, you know, between these hours, I'm gonna do this. And after every two hours of working, I'm gonna stretch because I shouldn't be sitting for hours at a time. And so just that helps your, um, keeps you away from being depressed and just being alone with your thoughts. And then I think the other thing is like, we just, we live in such an amazing time where there aren't really any gatekeepers anymore. You know, if, if you wanna have a show, there's YouTube, like go, go create a show. You don't need anyone's permission. You barely need any money. You just need a computer or a phone. Um, and so just go create something, like use the time to, to say this is what I'm building during this time. And so devoting your energy to that, I think is um, to be helpful to people who aren't sure what to do next. Well, we so appreciate your time this morning. Steve Acha with us here on the Megacast. You can find out more about him by going to steveacho.com. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Our next guest with us will be talking about the Michigan Festival and events going into 2021. This is the Oakland County Megacast. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance. Especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local, and especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Thank you for hanging with us on this Tuesday morning. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studios alongside the one, the only Mr. Tyler Keith. Tyler, my uh, tea is finally cool enough that for me to like be able to drink. It only took like two hours for you, didn't it? You know? Right. I don't know if anyone else. Okay, let's just burn your tongue. Good morning. <laughs> Nothing wakes you up like a you know, like a second degree burn on your tongue. I know. I'm looking for the uh, disclaimer. Oh, right here. Careful. Uh, the beverage you're yeah. about to enjoy is extremely hot. They, they don't want to turn into McDonald's. You know? That is so true. But uh, with that, uh, I'm excited to have our last guest here with us on the Megacast. Let's bring in Mike Sukint. He is the president and CEO for the Michigan Festival and Events Association. I cannot wait, Mike, to go to a festival. How are you doing? Ronnie, I'm doing great. Tyler, thank you for having me on. I appreciate being part of this. And yes, we are bringing back the fun in 2021. You need to get shirts made with that saying. You need mugs because I think a lot of people are ready to have some fun right now. So how are you planning uh, for 2021 and the festivals, what do you think the season's going to look like? Well, we're telling all of our uh, festival organizers that the only thing that I can guarantee right now is if you don't plan your event, you won't have it. 
And I know that sounds very profound, but it, it, it's, it's the truth. You're better off to plan it and make a plan A and a plan B in case you have to modify it. If you have to cancel it, so be it, everyone will know it, but if you don't plan it, it won't happen. Uh, some good news, the state of New York is uh, opening up festivals and events, so that's, that's a good sign. And uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, you know, the, the numbers are showing that the, uh, the curves are downward and they've been trending downward for uh, quite some time. So uh, I'm looking forward to it and uh, we're gonna have them. Hey, what's so hard about this is what you were just saying there, Mike, is uh, the numbers are trending down. But we also know the numbers can just as easily trend up and that can make planning some of these events a little bit challenging well that's true uh, it, it can but in addition to the numbers trending down the number of vaccines <coughs> being available is also trending up so between the two um, I'm very optimistic uh, so uh, what are your thoughts about the vaccine do you think uh, it's going to basically get to the time that in order to attend some of these events such as uh, festivals and concerts and you know sporting events people are going to have to show that they've had the vaccine Ronnie, right, I don't want to speculate on what the regulations are going to be on that that has been an open discussion on how you're going to be able to prove that whether or not you're going to be able to prove that whether or not an employer is going to make a mandatory or not mandatory um, there's a lot of discussions behind all that um, one of the things that I heard is that uh, it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a windfall for uh, attorneys. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, the attorneys always win during this time, right? Or these types of debates. Exactly. I, I, but I will say um, I do know that some people are hesitant to be back in a crowd, but a lot of people are so ready that if you have an event, do you anticipate the crowds could be larger because look, we're ready to party. Well, yes, and, and you're 100% correct on that. People are ready to, to get out there and, and socialize. There have been some events already this year that have had some fantastic numbers uh, of attendees and uh, they were not spreader events. The, 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 the statistics were not there. Um, there was a, a very good event in St. Clair Shores, uh, middle of January. They had a huge turnout on that. Um, it was, it was the, the attendance was more than what was expected. For the most part, people were social distancing and they were wearing their mask and they were behaving themselves. And, and it, was, it was huge. Um, Frankenmuth had their uh, Winterfest the last weekend in January, and uh, they scaled it down. They uh, sent the, the ice carvers home uh, before the, everything happened, and they still had a huge event. Friday night was very slow. A friend of mine called me and said, uh, are you here in Frankenmuth? I said, no, I'm not. Uh, this is good because the only thing we have here right now is cold. But on, on Saturday, it was somewhat shining. Frankenmuth is a community of less than, or just over 10,000 people. They're seven miles off of the expressway, and the expressway exit was backed up a mile down the road, people trying to get off to go to Frankenmuth. Now, keep in mind, this was the weekend prior to restaurants being open. Wow. So. It was a scaled back event, but the population, people wanted to get out there. They wanted to, they, they would go into the restaurants, they would order their food, and they'd take them out and find some place to dine outside. The gift shops, the, 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 the bakeries, the, you know, a friend of mine owns a bakery up there, he showed me a picture of the bakery, and the line was two and a half hours long to get in there to get their stuff, and people are standing in line for it because people are hungry to get out there and, and start resuming life. 
That is so true. Uh, Mike Sue Kent with us here on the Mega Cast. He's the president and CEO for the Michigan Festival and Events Association. And Mike, can you talk to us a little bit more for us that maybe we attend some of these events and festivals, but we don't really understand the level of uh, commitment and dedication it takes and coordination to pull off some of these events. What is the behind the scenes like to uh, be able to have an event or some of these festivals? Well, Ronnie, it's, it's really a twofold question. One is how to put on an event. What goes into it? There's, there's permitting. There's, there's permitting from the community to be able to have that event. Uh, there's permitting from the health department if you're going to be uh, serving food products in that event. There's, there's the and now because of COVID, it's the health department for uh, what, what your guidelines are. And my, my response to that is don't ask the health department, what do I got to do to be able to have an event? Go to the health department with your plan. Because if you're asking them to put up to put together their plan, they have more than enough on their plate to keep them busy. They're just going to say, you can't do it. So you have to have the you got to take the responsibility to come up with your plan. You need to talk with your local law enforcement, whether it's a county, township, village, city, and say this is how we're planning on handling traffic control. And and obviously, you need to follow the CDC guidelines. Now, the other part of that equation is festivals and events in the state of Michigan is a one billion dollar economic impact on our economy. So it's huge. The number of non the, the nonprofits, the charities that are benefiting from festivals and events did not get in 2020 the $15.5 million that they would have normally gotten with festivals and events. So it's not just that fun thing that happens that everybody likes to go to. There is an economic impact on those events. It, well, and if uh, someone out there is thinking about putting on such a festival or event and they haven't done so before, they need to reach out to uh, your industry because you guys are the experts to give them that advice to be able to do it and pull it off. What has been the experience in working with some of the uh, township officials and getting some of these permits? The township official, you know, it's, everybody's autonomous, so it depends on it depends on, uh, on on the organization and what their feelings are on it. And the same thing goes with the health departments. We we have the HHS that gives the, their recommendation and their mandates, but each of the local health departments have the ability to interpret how those are going to be implemented. And you know. It could be as different as one community, uh, this, the, uh, the city doesn't want to have it because they want to keep everybody safe, but the township or the county says, come on across the street onto our property and you can have the event. I mean, it is really literally that different. Wow, it's so crazy and so hard to plan for these things as well. Is it better for people if they're thinking about doing this to have them outdoors? Obviously the outdoor events are, are safer. Um, if you're going to do an indoor event, it's, it's all about uh, uh, air filtration and air circulation to be able to, to keep the air moving so it doesn't become stagnant. It's the same thing. I mean, that's when did we get our spike? Our spike happened when the cold weather hit and everybody started being indoors. So, yes, the outdoor events are better than the indoor events. Yeah, and, but right and, now we're in the middle of an, an Arctic freeze and our numbers are going back down. So do you look at those numbers and you go, hey, this is a positive sign? They are positive signs. That's why I say I am very optimistic. I'm optimistic with the with the numbers going down as far as new cases and the death rate. I'm optimistic because the number of vac vaccines and vaccinations that are happening are going up. And I'm also excited to see that uh, a state such as New York is opening up festivals and events. And th those things are all trending in a positive direction. Yeah. Now, as I said, follow the guidelines, make sure you keep yourself safe, 
your patrons safe, your volunteers safe, and your employees safe. And those CDC guidelines do change quite often, and uh, so that's why one of the things we do here at Civic Center TV is try to keep people informed, so you'll find a link to the CDC's website through our website, civiccentertv.com because I've read through some of these guidelines, uh, Mike, and I have to say, uh, they can be so confusing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's why I say you really need to, you, you need to look at them and you need to put together your plan and submit that to the health department and say, is this something that, that is acceptable to you? Um, well, and obviously, okay, right here in, in Michigan, we're in the middle of the winter, and there are typically festivals going on right now, but really it's the uh, summer and spring, you know, spring and summertime, big festival times as well as the fall time. What's your prediction? What's the festival season going to look like? It's going to be a slow start. I'm hoping that uh, June will be back to normal. According to uh, Michigan Department of Transportation, they are expecting by the beginning of April that travel will be up to uh, numbers better than what we were a year ago. And they are also saying that by July 4th, our numbers should be back to normal as far as travel goes. Now, the festivals and events, that's, that's a different story. If we do not have festivals this year, if we are, if our carnival industry is not able to generate revenue because they're, they're, they're in a short window, a lot of those places are gonna go bankrupt. They're gonna end up selling off equipment and when we get back to normal, it's gonna be a challenge to be able to find festivals and events in the state of Michigan because those entities that depend on this industry to uh, make a living are gonna be gone. Oh, yeah, and you know, I know that they've tried to support them through grants and some of these other loans, but it doesn't make up for that loss of revenue. For me, I'm looking uh, forward to, it's kind of like the sign of the summer here in the Metro Detroit area when you have the St. Mary's uh, big festival over there. I live right around the corner. It's great. You can walk down, get a candy apple and my big donut ear, and I just cannot wait. Um, what's your big festival that you're looking forward to? All of them. <laughs> You're going to every single one this year, huh? My wife and I bought a travel trailer this year because that seemed to be the thing to do. I've got new video camera and we are planning on hitting the road and uh, videoing uh, festivals and events and showing them on our YouTube page. That is so awesome. That's a good way to spend your yeah. summer as well as your fall. And I'm glad that your wife is willing to go along with that. Um, Mike, I'm going to tell you that uh, I think uh, calories shouldn't count this uh, festival season. Let it all go. Yes. When did they? <laughs> Yeah, you know, those lemonades. So, oh, gosh, uh, like that freshly squeezed lemonade. Yeah, I love it. It's so, it, it's just like you don't get that type of food in the atmosphere anyplace else. Um, uh, Mike, anything else before we say goodbye that you want people to know? Well, if you want to find out about the festivals and events in your area or anywhere else around the state of Michigan, or if you want to look at the guidelines and the recommendations, everything that we have is available at michiganfun.com. And, and so I know that one of the good things, Mike, they're saying that they are hoping at any rate, any individual that wants to have a vaccine should be able to have one by uh, July, which of course um, is in the middle of the festival season, but also going into the big fall season as well. Um, do you anticipate that or COVID-19 um, testing is going to be a part of people getting access into some of these festivals? Well, first Just of all, hard to the, say. The, well, the, the COVID vaccine is going by priority. So the, the, your, your, your first responders are getting it and those people over 65 are getting it. And the reason why they're going after, they're getting the vaccine to those um, populations first is because they're the most vulnerable. The, the, the younger uh, adults are less vulnerable to that. So as they start to get it, it becomes better. I think that late June, early July, we should be, uh, I wish I had a crystal ball to say this is the way it was gonna happen. 
But then if I had a crystal ball, I'd be playing Powerball and getting the numbers <laughs> on that also. So I, my, my chances are being correct are about the same. Um, but I really do anticipate that the festival and event and fairs and everything will be at a normal pace come the end of June, beginning of July. Well, I hope your crystal ball is correct. We so appreciate your time here today with us. Well, I thank you having me on the air. I really appreciate being a part of this. Well, when you're in the area, if you come down for the St. Mary's Festival in May, we'll see you there. I'll buy you a candy apple. I'll take you up on that. <laughs> Thanks again, Mike. Sue Kent with us here on the Megacast. He's the president and CEO for the Michigan Festival and Events Association. Please take time to follow them on their social media sites to find out all of the fun events coming up here in 2021. As he said, we want to bring back the fun in 2021. Tyler, I am so looking forward to that. Yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll get back to some of that fun later on this year. And as the year goes on, keep trying to find new ways to have fun while we are still in this pandemic situation that we're in because the fun will come back as normal and when it does it's going to be a lot of fun oh well that's going to wrap up our fun for this tuesday here on the mega cast but we want to say thank you to all of you for tuning in stay safe stay healthy